it's interesting how my brother Nick, we both end up in the same place, but have such an opposite story. Like my story is a story of abandonment and just feeling left alone since I've been a kid. So my dad left when I was about three or four years old. Um, I was molested when I was six years old. So that really feels like no one's there to keep you safe and guard you. Um, my mom was a big alcoholic back then. And it seemed like, like I never had anybody around. Like I never had an attachment to my mother. I always wonder how my friends had this kind of relationship with their mom, even when their dad wasn't around. They always loved their mom and I never had that. Just felt alone. Um, 12 years old was pretty much when everything took a turn for the worst. I got drunk for the first time. I smoked weed for the first time. I lost my virginity at 12 years old. I started drug dealing when I was 12 years old. And, uh, and so that, and you know, I would say that music really shaped my brain because I had an older brother who was six years older than me and rap music became like my father figure pretty much. So I was listening to Tupac at like eight years old and, and just the worst you could ever imagine. So I guess that's what kind of shaped the way I thought about things. And then, and then a girl broke my heart from, the girl that you know, I, I was with when I was 12 years old ended up breaking my heart. So I had no idea of what love was supposed to be. So instead of leaving myself open to this, I just, was, I just caused chaos everywhere. So instead of trying to keep everything in control, I just destroyed everything around me. Um, I didn't let anybody get close to me. Uh, I never tried to fit in with anybody on purpose and I was just like a rebel just trying to just destroy anything and everything that I possibly could um, so I've had an identity as a drug dealer I continue to live like that for as long as I could until uh, I got in a car accident and I was driving drunk had all my drugs on me, my scale. There was two girls in the car with me. I had no license. The rental car was in my mom's name because she thought she was renting it for this girl that I was just using and abusing, putting everything in her name. That's just kind of part of the lifestyle. And uh, crashed that car in Gatineau Hills. And it was very interesting because I never believed in God my whole life and just felt like it's me against the world. And then once I crashed that car, the car was completely totaled and nobody was hurt in the car. And I just took off into the forest because OnStar came on and I'm telling the girls to be quiet, don't say anything while I'm looking for my cell phone because that's my lifeline as a drug dealer. And uh, just tell them don't say anything. Like, and then uh, eventually one of the girls finally said something because OnStar was like, hello, you guys okay? She's like, yeah, we're fine. You know, we're in Gatineau Hills and that was it. I was just, just gone after that. Um, so I'm running in the woods, preparing my drugs and everything because I'm going to jail like 100% in my mind. And uh, I have, this is my first time in Gatineau Hill, so I have no idea. It's like two or three in the morning. And I'm just running through the forest, running and running and running, sticks all in my face, all in my hair. I end up falling into a swamp, which is almost like a baptism almost or something. <laughs> I don't know, because that was the day of reckoning for me, one of them at least. And then uh, I finally find a road. And, you know, it's like whatever, maybe a football field long this road with a bend on one end and a bend on the other. And the sense of relief came over me because I've, I'm not going to be lost in the woods at this point. And now that I found this, it's, whew, the adrenaline goes away. And now it's like, okay, now I'm just waiting for the cops to find me. So I lay in the trenches, I'm in shorts and a t-shirt, soaking wet, took my shoes off because I didn't want to catch some like swamp disease on my feet or whatever. And uh, <laughs> I heard swamp feet or something, I don't know. But um, you know, I'm, I'm laying there like in a fetal position really with my t-shirt over my legs. And I'm just trying to go to sleep at this point because I was drunk again and I was always smoking weed like people smoke cigarettes. And um, just trying to go to sleep because my body is just wrecked at this point and I couldn't sleep because the bugs were just so loud like it is ridiculous how loud they are in Gatineau Hills at two in the morning um <laughs> wasn't trying to be funny it sucked but <laughs> but uh so obviously I can't fall asleep and uh I'm just like like 
expecting the cop like hurry up because I'm like I'm gonna be good when I get to jail because I'm gonna be making enough money in there and like this is already the lifestyle I was living. Um, I just wanted dry clothes and a place to sleep and uh, and so I'm watching. I see the cops getting close now, and I could see the lights flickering through the the, the trees. You know the red and blue and then his spotlight poof, waving back and forth. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And then now I'm in the middle of this like road, the stretch of road in the trench. And I'm watching, and I, now I see his lights like just blasting. Like it, I, that's just the only way I could describe it. They were just blasting right there. And um, now I'm like, okay, finally. And then I, what, I, what ends up happening is like, there's a couple cars that are coming. Shh. And then the cars would drive by me. And then another car, and it would drive by me. And I'm like, what's going on? And then it, I realized that the cop set up a checkpoint right there. So I never seen the police car at this point. Didn't never see him, just seen his lights blazing right there. Um, and it's RCMP and I, I swear I heard like a dog barking too. So all these little things that were adding up, keep them in mind. So the cop stays right there, I never see him, cars drive by me. And I swear something in me, like cause I was waiting to go to jail and then something in me just like, I swear it was God. I said, get up and start walking. So I got up barefoot and just started walking on the road. Just walking. And I remember I just kept, I kept looking back and just watching those lights get farther and farther away. I can picture it, like, vividly to this day. Just they kept getting farther away and farther away and farther away. And I'm walking down this road barefoot. By the time I ended up, I ended up at this place with, uh, like, a, it was like metaphorically, I guess, too, it was a crossroad where now instead of just being like a drained zombie of just like, like God was carrying me, you know, and uh, I had to consciously make a decision at this point to either keep going on this path or change my path. And it was actually a hill or I keep going straight, a hill to like another low road. And so it's interesting that I changed my path and I went up and I was so egotistical and again like I felt abandoned so I never asked anybody for help if anything I would take care of people because I always had the money and whatever and I'd always I never asked anybody for help I would never do that and I got to the top of that hill and uh I I remember I was just like I need help I need help I need help and I have no idea, like it was so weird because I was completely out of my nature to do something like that. And, and I took a couple more steps and then I see this house there. I walk up to the house. Long story short, they directed me to uh, this general store that's in Chelsea, Quebec. And there's a pay phone there. I call the cab. And then I'm on the phone with my ex at the time who I was, like I said, um, saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go off in the West because of statute limitations and hide out there for a while because the car is in my mom's name. My fingerprints are all over the car, everything, whatever. And um, as I'm on the phone, leaning against, this, leaning against this pay phone while I'm on the bench, like kind of like sitting like this and I'm just leaning against the pay phone. It's about like daylight's cracked now because I've been walking for two hours barefoot. I have blisters on my feet. That's how long I was walking for. Right when I'm like, right when I finished the phone call with the cab, which I had to get up and go find an address because I have no idea this area, get back to the payphone on the phone with her saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. The cop just drives by me, shoof, right by me. I get home and that's when I realized like I was not alone. I was like as egotistical as I was, as self-preservation mode that I was in, I realized that there was something outside of me that was caring for me, that threw me in the swamp so the dogs wouldn't catch my scent, that held the cop there. Oh, I forgot to mention that when I booked into the forest and the girls tried to told Anser where we were, a car came and picked them up. I heard the vroom, like it was a loud enough car, like when they downshift. I heard them get picked up. All these things in place because it wasn't my time. And God wanted to reveal himself fully to me that he was there for me. And then you have like a recollection. Once you realize that there's been an external force outside of you that helped me there, that cared about me, that I cried out for help. I look back at all the times now where he's been there always. And I'm starting to see all these times where I didn't get what I deserved so many different times. 
and it just blew my mind to I, like that abandonment went away, knowing that God was there always. Um, fast forward a month after that, I'm hiding out of my parents' house because I'm not going to stay with my ex, who the car was rented for. Um, and now I do something because I'm still drug dealing, even though I know God. I don't. I don't. Sorry, even I don't know God. I know He exists, and I know that He cared about me but I had no idea of anything that he expects of me or how to live properly. And um, I commit some crimes and I'm facing five to six years in jail now. And again, he gives me grace where I don't ever, like I went to jail for seven days before I got bail, which I shouldn't have got bail by a miracle because a year before all this happened, my parents got remarried. So they divorced like around 20 years before that. My dad was never around in my life. See, maybe at Christmas or something. And then, uh, boom, my parents are remarried. And the judge sees, looks like I have a together family. And she gives me bail, which I shouldn't have got. But God had this all planned out. My parents are serving God, by the way, at this time too. So interestingly enough, I'm on bail now facing a year and a half, or a year and a half on bail facing five to six years in jail. He gives me grace again. Even I, I accepted at this point. I said, you know what? If I'm going to go to death, your will. At this point, I was like done trying to live how I thought I should be living. And I'm, I was just like, God, I'm in your hands. And uh, he end, I end up not stepping foot in jail again. The, the judge was like, I didn't even ex like she had to take a recess to go get papers. She never expected to get because of the deal that the crown and my lawyer worked out. And God just continued to show me that he was there for me and that I was forgiven for how I was living and that he has a different path for me. So now me and my parents, it took a long time to get here, obviously because of all that trauma that I went through, but we have a great relationship now. I have two beautiful kids now. I have a career that I never thought I would have had. Um, I have support from, uh, it's gonna make me cry to even say that part, bro. <laughs> These people that have watched me struggle and they never abandoned me and uh, gave me purpose, so thank you, John.